Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 34 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Amy Jill Levine is University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University Divinity School and the College of Arts and Sciences. She describes herself as a Yankee Jewish feminist who teaches us, who teaches in a predominantly Christian divinity school in the buckle of the Bible belt. I think you'll agree that's an accurate description when we're done with the program. She's held office in the Society of Biblical Literature, the Catholic Biblical Association, the Association for Jewish Studies. She's the author, co-author, or editor of numerous books, including The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus, and her newest book, Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. In this week, when Christians around the world commemorate and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus following his death on Friday, when Jews prepare for the celebration of Passover, she will offer insight into the Jewish Jesus and provide a deeper understanding of who he was and what his teachings were to the people of his time and to people today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Amy Jill Levine. Lovely. If you keep applauding, I won't have to talk at all. That's marvelous. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, a blessed season for those of you who are Christian. Happy Passover for those of you who are Jewish. And for those of you who are academics, I hope you're on spring break. Um, <laughs> what, what we're going to do, and I've been asked to talk for about 20, 25 minutes, is to talk about who Jesus might have been to the people who first encountered him, as well as who he is to people who encounter him today. It seems to me that today, for Christians, Jesus has to be more than just a really interesting rabbi. He's got to be more than that. But that's the job of the church to proclaim. He's also got to be that really interesting rabbi. He's got to be a first century Jew, fully human, who made sense to other Jews in his own time. So what I find in looking at Jesus is I can recover some Jewish history, right? He's a first century Jew, he's one of ours. So what we'll do this morning is we'll talk about, in an act of what might be considered historical imagination, to try to get a sense of who he was, how people heard him, why some people followed him, and other people did not. At the end, we get to have Q&A. However, it is unlikely that we will all agree on everything. The day we all agree on everything is the day the Messiah comes, or if you prefer, comes back. Right? So the point of interreligious conversation is not so that at the end of the day or the end of the lecture, we all hold hands and sing kumbaya, or if you're Jewish, hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yachad. You know, how good it is that brothers dwell together. The point is that we begin to understand each other a little better. And ideally, we could then look at our neighbors and say, that's not my tradition, that's your tradition. But I can see truth there, and I can see beauty there, and I can take inspiration from what you are proclaiming. I do not worship Jesus as Lord and Savior. My heart is completely filled with my own Judaism. Um, but I find much of what he says to be compelling. In other words, I don't worship the messenger, but I find much of the message of the kingdom of heaven to resonate extremely well. And in that case, you can say I have a little bit of Christ envy. All right. So what do we know about Jesus? Make myself comfortable, take off my shoes, and here we go. All right. What do we know about him? Well, we know that he's a healer and an exorcist. In the company of Jesus, as the New Testament tells us, the blind see. People possessed by demons find peace. The paralyzed gain full use of their bodies. And I think this healing is important because it says that bodies are important. For Jesus, for Christianity, 
because they come out of Judaism, we have to pay attention to bodies. It's not just a head thing, and it's not just a heart thing. It's also a limb thing. In antiquity, we have miracle, and we have medicine, and we have magic. So how do we know that Jesus is engaged in miracle? Because it comes for free. Free health care is a miracle. So we know that even today. Medicine and magic cost money. Uh, but what this tells us is Jesus is concerned about human bodies. And that also becomes part of the proclamation of the church. The church proclaims something called the incarnation, the taking on of flesh by the divine. And they really meant flesh, as we think like chili con carne. It's that kind of carne, that kind of flesh. And the church proclaims the resurrected Jesus in the body. Jesus does not come back as the friendly ghost. He comes back in a body. And he heals body. And this tells me that bodies are important. So what does Jesus tell me? He tells me that I should pay attention to other people's bodies to make sure that they have enough food, and they have shelter, and they have clothing, and they have health care. It's one of the things that Jesus tells me. What else is he? He's a teacher. And teachers in the first century debate. That's what they do. The word Israel traditionally means to wrestle with God. And one way one does that is to wrestle with the biblical text. Jesus engages in debate with fellow Jews. That puts him right at the heart of Judaism. Because we have a Torah, we have a law, but then we have to have people figure out what it means. The Torah says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Do no work on the Sabbath. And now we have to figure out what constitutes work. And now we're in the matter of argumentation. When it comes to debating the law, Jesus is not what we would consider today a liberal rabbi or a reform rabbi. By the way, in Judaism, the term is reform, not reformed. Reformed are Presbyterians. <laughs> when Jesus talks about the law, he actually makes it more rigorous. And what he's doing is what rabbinic tradition calls building a fence about the law. You have a law. Jesus makes another pronouncement to make sure you don't violate the law. The law says don't murder. Jesus says don't be angry with anybody else. I cannot murder even though I live in a state where guns are fairly well available. I live in Tennessee. But Jesus says don't murder. More he says don't be angry because if you're not angry, you're less likely to murder. The law says don't commit adultery, which by the way in Judaism requires two witnesses, so getting convicted is sort of sloppy on your part. But, <laughs> but what, what Jesus says is not only don't commit adultery, but don't think about it. In other words, make sure your heart and your head are inclined toward what you're doing. He makes the law more rigorous. He takes it seriously. And that means that Christians should take what Christians call the Old Testament seriously. The Old Testament for the church is the grounding of the teaching of Jesus, and it must be known. What else do I know about him? He teaches in parables. And parables are a genre well known to Jews at the time. There's an old line about religion that religion was designed to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And people back then knew that if someone told a parable, those stories were not banal statements of the obvious, and they were not children's stories, although children can understand them. They were designed to do a little bit of heart surgery, to, to do some personal excavation. They tell us what we already know, but we simply don't want to acknowledge. So when we hear a parable and we think, isn't that nice or isn't that sweet? We're probably not listening very well, because parables are actually designed to indict. And if we paid attention to them, they would help us figure out what our major concerns are and what we can let go. They would help us better relate to our family, better relate to our neighbors, better deal with people we would consider opponents or enemies. They're absolutely marvelous teaching tools. I also know that Jesus' followers interpreted the parables. There's an expression I've learned in Tennessee. Uh, the expression is, bless your heart. I don't know if this is familiar to you. Um, it, it's, it's a catch-all. You can say it if you want to express pity, if you can say it if you want to express congratulations, and you can also say it if you're about to be mildly critical. The church, bless its heart, came in 
and interpreted the parables in a very nice way. So that we have, for example, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. And Luke the evangelist comes in and says after the lost sheep, therefore I tell you there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 who are righteous, as if this parable was about repenting and forgiving. First century Jews aren't hearing that, among other things, because sheep don't repent. There's no such thing as sheep shame or merino metanoia. And moreover, the sheep owner lost the sheep, and God doesn't lose us. The parable is about counting and noting that even if one sheep out of 99 goes missing, you pay attention to that sheep. So that when we come to the parable of the prodigal son and we're told there was a man who had two sons, we have to pay attention to both children. After the prodigal comes home and there's rejoicing and feasting and accessorizing and fatted calf, the very next line is, the older brother was in the field and he heard the sound of music and dancing. And he called the slave to ask, what's happened? And the slave says, your brother has come back safe and sound and dad's throwing a party. They had enough time to call the band and the caterer <laughs> and nobody thought to call the older son because there was a man who had two sons and he didn't count. And that's some of the profundity of the parable. If we take it all as about repenting and forgiving, that's terrific. Those are wonderful lessons, and I wouldn't want to give them up. But that tells us how we could rejoice and be safe. But the parable indicts, whom have we not counted? Whom have we left to feel as if he or she did not count? Who have we left out? And the parables continue to indict. Jesus is also a teacher in that he teaches his disciples to pray. Um, he would have known how to pray. He's Jewish. He knows the Psalms. He knows regularized Jewish prayers, and he simply asks to them. He says, when you pray, call God Father. This is not new. Jews have been calling God Father since before the time of Jesus to today when we pray, Avinu Sheba Shemayim, our Father, the one who is in heaven. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King which means when we relate to God, God is not some distant father. God is not like the fellows in Mad Men who go off and have affairs and drink cocktails. First century Jewish fathers are hands-on, connected to the family, trustworthy. Jesus teaches us to hallow the divine name, which Jews have been doing since Moses had a conversation with a burning bush. And he said to the bush, you know, when it, God, what's your name so that I can tell the people who you are? And instead of saying, my name is Susan, or my name is George, or my name is Manuel, God says, I will be what I will be. God is free to be. God is a verb. God is being. So once we think we can put God in a box and say we know everything about that God, we have failed to hallow the divine name because no one tradition, no one church, no one religion has a lock on this particular God. Give us this day our daily bread in a first century context would have probably meant something like, give us tomorrow's bread today. Because first century Jews, many of them imaged heaven, imaged the world to come, the olam haba, as a great banquet. What do you do when you get into heaven? You eat. And this is why the church meets people at table. This is why Jesus keeps feeding people. This is why Eucharistic ministry or communion or the Lord's Supper is still celebrated. We actually know how important all this feeding is from the Christmas story as well as the story of the Last Supper. You can fill this in. Mary gave birth to her firstborn child and wrapped him in swaddly clothes and laid him in a a manger. Think of the French manger. It's a feeding trough. Where else do you put the person whom the church will proclaim bread of the world? And that's why we need to read the text closely. And at the same time, what this prayer is saying is we know there are people who are hungry, and we know that some of us have food. Give us this day our daily bread would be hypocritical if we consumed inside the church and didn't provide food for people who needed it on the outside. Forgive us our, yeah. You wonder why Jews are confused. 
sins, debt, trespass. It turns out that the same Aramaic word underlines all three translations. So what did Jesus ask? Did he ask for forgiving sins or forgiving trespasses or forgiving debts? I think, in fact, he was punning for people who needed to let go of sin. He said, let go. And for people who are holding debt, he said, stop holding that debt. You have someone else needs. You give. And that would be helpful as well. His followers hailed him by various titles, son of God. Well, but son of, we're all children of God. That's not actually a special title in early Judaism. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke has a genealogy, and it starts with Jesus, and it works its way back to Adam, and Adam is then called the Son of God, which means according to the Christian proclamation following from Judaism, we are all sons and daughters of God. We are all in the image and likeness of God. Jesus told his followers that they had to love their enemies. I can't find that in early Judaism. He is distinct here. In early Judaism, if our enemy is hungry, we have to feed the enemy. If our enemy loses a donkey, we have to return it. We can't mislead the enemy. Jesus takes those laws one step farther and says, you have to love them. I think that's consistent with the teaching that we're all in the image and likeness of God, because it means I have to look at the face of my enemy, a terrorist, uh, a person who would want to kill me rather than live near me, somebody on the opposite sports team from which I am rooting, and I have to be able to see the face of God in that person as well. Jesus is consistent with that. His followers proclaimed him Messiah, but in the first century there was no messianic job description. It's not as if somebody had gone up to the temple and tacked on a list saying, Make sure mother is a virgin at the time of your conception. Heal people, walk on water, raise the dead, die, come back, ascend. There's no messianic job description. So what were people thinking about Jesus? For some of them, his Jewish followers, they were convinced that he would bring about the messianic age, the time when there is no more war, no more disease, no more death, everybody is resurrected from the dead. Most first century Jews believed in resurrection. We can see that on the lips of Jesus' friend Martha, who says, I believe in the resurrection on the last day. You've probably heard of the Sadducees. The Sadducees are frequently identified in the New Testament as the Sadducees, those who say there's no resurrection. That makes them the outliers. Or as I am wont to say in the classroom, they don't believe in the resurrection, and that's what made them sad, you see. You can work with that. <laughs> For early Judaism, the Messiah came with the Messianic Age, and the Messianic Age included general resurrection of the dead. Jesus' resurrection was proclaimed, and people waited for everyone else to come back, and they didn't. And gradually, because that Messianic promise was not fulfilled, the followers of Jesus began to dwindle among the Jewish community, even as they began to rise among the Gentiles. First century Jews already believed in resurrection. First century Jews already had the Bible. But for the broader Gentile world, Jesus represented hope. He represented resurrection. He represented forgiveness of sins. He represented a sense of a better world and a better fellowship. Was he Messiah? Was he Lord? In terms of those questions, here historians stop. We cannot prove the resurrection. We cannot disprove it. It exists in one's heart. My major concern in the classroom is not actually what my students believe, but what they do based on that belief. How does believing in Jesus make them change? For those people who want to argue using Christian apologetics that you can prove that Jesus is Lord and Savior, it simply can't be done. Because if we attempt to make a proof, we're engaging in category confusion. Religious belief is not logic. Paul calls the cross a scandal and a folly. The idea that a Jewish carpenter would be savior of the world is a tough market sell, if you think about it. But people were convinced of it in their hearts. So the best way of thinking about this belief issue 
is to think belief is based in your heart. It's not based in your head. Faith is based on grace that comes from the outside to which one responds. It's not based on academics. It's not based in IQ. And it's not based in how much you read. In other words, faith is like love. It is not like Sudoku. If it were like Sudoku, everybody would get the right answer if they were just smart enough. But faith is like love. And what makes sense to one person makes absolutely no sense to somebody else. And I can prove that because I can tell you about some of the people my children have dated. <laughs> Where the academics comes in is once the faith is in place, then historians can say, look at Jesus. Look at how extraordinary he was. If I think he's extraordinary and I'm not a Christian, how much more so should Christians see just how marvelous, just how inspirational his teaching was? And finally, what then happens regarding the final judgment? And what do we do about this? <clears throat> when it comes to what happens to us after we die, I am not yet clued in and do not want to be for quite a while. But here's how I imagine things. So far, I've been talking about history. For a final comment, this I made up. After a very, very long and happy life I die, I find myself at the pearly gates. Two things to know about the pearly gates. First, the word for pearl in Greek is margarita. So you can work with this. <clears throat> and second, the pearly gates are wide open because I don't think heaven is a gated community. Standing at the pearly gates of St. Peter, you can tell he's Peter because he's got a little rock insignia. It's a little bit of Bible humor, because Peter really means rocky. It's a nickname. And Peter says to me, AJ, welcome to heaven. You can get your harp and your halo here and your wings and your slippers at the next table. And I said, Peter, wait, I have questions. Like, can you speak Greek? And what happened to your wife? And who won the food fight that you had with Paul in Antioch? And where did you wander off to at the end of the book of Acts? And Peter says, look, lady, I'm on duty now. Pick up your accessories, and we'll talk after dinner. It's fabulous. Standing behind me is a fellow who, in his earlier life, was a television evangelist. You can tell his hair is perfect. His teeth are perfect. His pants have a crease. You could get a paper cut if you touch them. Perfect. And he has managed to find in the heavenly anteroom a copy of a King James version of the Bible with the words of Jesus written in red letters. He also could have found a copy of the Jewish Publication Society version of the Tanakh, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, the Bhagavad Gita, the complete works of Mary Baker Eddy, and a variety of other religious texts, because this is my image of heaven. And he says to Peter, excuse me, Peter, I don't mean to make trouble my first day in heaven. But did not our Lord and Savior say right here in the Gospel of John in red letters that he is the way, the truth, and the life? And how is it that this Jew, he points at me, is getting in? And Peter says, Eugewalt. <laughs> Wait here. And he comes back in just a few minutes with a fellow who's maybe about 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, with dark, piercing eyes that look right into your soul and with holes in his palms. Because as we know from the Gospel of John, the resurrected Jesus still bears the wounds of the cross. And Peter says, Lord, we have another one. <laughs> Give this man credit of his convictions. He's going for it. He says, Lord, all my life I proclaimed you to be Savior. I've tried to bring people the Gospel. I've tried to lead them to baptism. Are you telling me that I was wrong? And Jesus says, my son, I do appreciate your efforts. And no, you're not completely wrong. But if you flip back over to the Gospel of Matthew, which does come first in the canon, I make it very clear that it's not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who do the will of the Father, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting people in prison, giving a cup of water to the least of these. It seems to me that my daughter, AJ, has done the best she could with the talents that she has. And the fellow says, wait a minute, that's works righteousness. You're saying she's earned her way into heaven. Getting into heaven is supposed to be a free gift, and Jesus says, exactly so. Flip back over to the Gospel of John, where I make it very clear that I am the way. Let me repeat, I am, not you. 
and not your narrow way of reading scripture and not your narrow sense of salvation and grace. I say she gets in. Do you want to argue? And the last thing I recall seeing before going off to get my heavenly accessories is Jesus handing the man a Kleenex to help get the log out of his eye. If the church wants to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, it should, because that's what the New Testament says. If the Christian wants to make Jesus the gatekeeper, that's fine with me too. Because the Jesus I know from history, the rabbi, the teacher, the member of the per people of Israel, this first century Jew, would be infinitely more concerned with how I love my neighbor and how I love the stranger and how I love my God than in the particulars of my theological belief. What finally can we say about Jesus? He cares about what we do. He insists that we show mercy and compassion to everyone. He's a fabulous Jewish teacher, and in the church, he's more than that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy Jo Levine. If you'd like to come back on Easter and proclaim the word again from this pulpit, you're welcome to. You're listening to Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson, the senior minister here at Westminster Presbyterian Church, and I'm the moderator of the forum. Our guest today is scripture scholar Dr. Amy Jo Levine. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church for our forum on Thursday, April 16th at 7 p.m. when author and journalist Craig Bernstein will be interviewed by NPR editor-at-large Gary Eichten on the topic, Can the System Work? Politics, Government, and Media. Our events are always free, always open to the public. Further information can be found at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Dr. Levine, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. First one has to do with the political nature of Jesus as we read about him in the Gospels and the importation of a political Jesus into the 21st century. Comments? I think the Bible should be used for political purposes because I'm inclined to use it for my political purposes. Yeah. Um, I don't see why we would not use this as a resource. And here I'm looking both at the scriptures of the synagogue and the scriptures of the church, which include the scriptures of the synagogue. So I have no problem bringing Jesus into political discourse. The other part that I would bring in along with the specifics of whatever laws we want to make or whatever policies we want to debate is I would want to make it clear that we should not demonize people on the other side. I think too often today we've substituted harsh rhetoric for actually listening to someone. And it often turns out that the person with whom I so vehemently disagree actually has some pretty good points to make. So how do we bring the Bible in? We bring it in as we have always done. The Bible has been cited on issues of war and slavery and economic policy and immigration reform. Why shouldn't we use it? Final point about this. Uh, Jesus is tempted by Satan, and in the extended temptation narratives in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, uh, Satan hurls Bible verses at Jesus, and Jesus hurls Bible verses back. It's the first example I have of proof texting. This tells me that the Bible can be used benevolently, but the Bible can also be used by Satan. So I need to make sure to use the cliche that the Bible is a rock on which I stand rather than a rock thrown to do damage. I think Jesus helps us with that. What's the number one thing most Christians get wrong about Jesus? Oh my, well, <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting to do a pew poll on that? Um, it depends upon the Christian. Heaven forbid that all Christians would think alike. 
There are many things that Christians often get wrong about Jesus. There are many things they often get right. The part that I hear from some of my students or people uh, in churches with whom I've worked, uh, that Jesus wanted to do away with the law. He basically said, don't worry, be happy, and the rest of it was unimportant. It was extremely important. Um, I hear that Jesus uh, came to end Judaism and begin Christianity. No indication of that. Um, I think where they really get Jesus wrong is they know what he said, but they don't act on it. That's good. We can stop there. <laughs> As I like to say, that'll preach. Uh, yes, it will. Getting, getting, well, we have a number of questions about the political nature of Jesus being used today. For instance, in some of the state legislators that are debating laws that uh, are purported to be for religious freedom, and the name of Jesus is brought in as uh, one who stands in one direction or another vis-a-vis -vis current cultural issues. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so we're talking about things like the Indiana law and the one pending in Georgia and probably a number of other states. That's right. Um, sure. Um, should everybody be treated equally? I think Jesus did think so, um, and that would be part of his own tradition. The book of Leviticus commands not only that you love your neighbor as yourself, but the very same chapter of Leviticus, this is Leviticus um, 19, goes on to say, you shall love the stranger who dwells among you because you were strangers in the land of Egypt, which I think ought to be cited a little bit more on immigration reform, but that's another subject. Um, yeah, should everybody be treated equally? Absolutely. Um, on the other hand, and here I'm trying to be as sensitive as I can to people who are sponsoring some of the uses of this law, I don't find it helpful to be deliberately provocative and try to force people to do something that takes them out of their religious comfort zone, because I don't think that's being merciful to them either. Um, so should people be allowed to uh, not get allowed to refuse to give a contract to somebody? I don't think that's helpful. I don't think that you should refuse to give a contract to somebody who's gay any more than you should because of that person's religious belief or ethnic group or racial identity. On the other hand, I would want people who recognize the religious proclivities of some of these folks not to get in their face and to tell them that they're bad and to tell them that they're bigots. They're trying to live out their faith as best as possible. So the communication needs to be one of grace and compassion rather than provocation. Are there Muslims doing uh, with Jesus the thing that you as a Jew are doing? And if so, who are some of the, the speakers, the writers? Reza Aslan comes to mind, who's spoken here at the forum. Others you can yeah. point us to? Um, I'm not an expert in Islam because I cannot read Arabic. And I will not speak professionally on a tradition if I can't read the material in the original. In graduate school, after doing the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic and the Coptic and the Syriac and the German and the French and the Latin and the smattering of Italian I needed, um, when my professor said, it's time to learn Arabic, I said, no, it's not. Um, but there are imams across the country and indeed across the world that have spoken out against terrorism, that have spoken out against some of the atrocities that we're seeing now that are attempting to work for peace, including in Nashville, the imam of the mosque in Murfreesboro, who has been targeted with enormous hate, has managed to come through and demonstrate to everybody how you show love in the face of hate. Number of questions about the uh, cultural context of the time of Jesus and the dominance of uh, male of patriarchy in that era. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah. Um, I really wish Jesus were a feminist. I so, I was so I, you know, if I had a chance to have like just a small chat with him, um, which I do on occasion, but I'm not getting the Bible changed. Um, an idea has developed among some liberals within the church, Protestants and Catholics, that Jesus invented feminism. Former President Jimmy Carter in his Bible tapes on the Epistle to the Ephesians suggests that first century Judaism is comparable to the Taliban and Jesus stands over and above it. Not so, and that's just a mischaracterization of early Judaism. So what do we know about Jewish women in the first century? Well, it actually turns out that the New Testament's one of the best resources that we have. They have access to their own funds. 
a lady with a hemorrhage who spent her money on physicians, the woman who anoints Jesus with her Chanel, which is probably easier to remember than Nard, um, the widow who puts her two coins in the temple treasury, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna, the women who, according to Luke chapter 8, support Jesus because Jesus is not taking in any money for the work that he does. They have their own funds. They own their own homes. Martha welcomed him into her home. The house church in Jerusalem is at the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark. They show up in the synagogues like the bent over lady. They show up in the temple like Anna or Mary, Jesus' mother, or the widow. And all those children who proclaim Jesus at the beginning of the Passion narrative, they're there with mommies and women caregivers, I'm pretty sure. They have freedom of travel as Mary visits Elizabeth and the women follow Jesus from Galilee in the north down to Judea and the south, and where is the women who remain faithful at the cross when the men hightail it out of there. Jewish women followed Jesus not because they were oppressed and suppressed and repressed and consequently depressed by Judaism. They followed Jesus for the same reason that their husbands and their fathers and their brothers and their sons followed him, because they found his message of the kingdom of God compelling, because they found healing in his presence. And it may have been that women who were apart from standard domestic arrangements, divorcees, widows, never married women, it's possible that they found a special place in his group. Jesus sets up what is, in effect, a new family. He talks about people leaving their father and mother, and according to Luke, their wives and their children, and joining him. He says, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? And the natal family is outside, and he looks around at the people in the house where he's teaching and says, here are my mother and brothers and sisters. Maybe women who don't have families found a new family with him in that group of people who have particular loyalty. It's very difficult to name a married couple, with the exception of Mary and Joseph, who are together and Jesus speaks with them. The two on the road to Emmaus, maybe. So when you get to Easter, drop in a woman on that road. And the other parents of Jairus and his wife, the parents of the dead girl. All the other women seem to be single. What does this tell me about women in churches today? If the followers of Jesus represent mother and brother and sister, it means that everybody in the church is part of the same family. That's actually what baptism means. And it means that if somebody in the congregation is missing from a service, you get on the phone and you say, where were you? And it means when somebody walks in, that's your mother or your brother or your sister. You say, hello, will you sit next to me, rather than, you're in my seat. <laughs> and you make sure that that person has a place to go after the service, because who knows whether that person has a place for lunch or the funds for it. Everybody's in the same family. So women around Jesus, they're patrons. They're people who have been healed. They're people who feel free to argue with him. I love that, um, which means they're people from whom he takes advice, and they're people who cared about him and whom he cared about. Let's talk about another, another first century Jewish male, the Apostle Paul. To what extent do you think Paul reflects accurately the teachings of Jesus, particularly around women? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I, I think I've made my peace with Paul. Um, Paul. Paul will always be a puzzle, um, just as Jesus will be a puzzle. Jesus, we do not have, to Jesus, we do not have direct access. What we have is the oral tradition that eventually got written down. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. The New Testament's written in Greek. And I don't know how much additional material beyond what Jesus actually said, the evangelist, bless their heart, added in. It's the same thing with Paul. We don't have direct access to him. We have the letters that the church chose to preserve. So who knows what else we're missing? And who knows whether the church added on some verses, some lines? It wouldn't surprise me that some letters were redacted. And moreover, it's possible that Paul changes his mind. Further, Paul is writing to individual congregations. He's not writing to the church universal which means when we're reading Paul's letters, we're reading somebody else's mail, and what's relevant to one church might not be relevant to another. In 1 Corinthians, he suggests that women should not teach or have any authority. They're to be silent. 
But in the epistle to the Romans, he recognizes a woman who is a deacon, her name is Phoebe, and a woman who's, who is an apostle, her name is Junia, and clearly they are teaching. So what do we do with Paul? I think it helps to put him in his historical context to recognize that he is writing ad hoc letters to specific congregations, to recognize that he might have changed his mind over time, and to recognize with Paul we're only getting half of the story. We do not know what he was directly told. We do not know if he is reflecting the problems in those target churches accurately, and we do not have access to him. So our best bet is to read Paul, but read Paul through the lens of history and in the church through the teachings of the Holy Spirit so that we're not just stuck on a couple of verses, but we get the entire Bible as a matter of teaching. There's the work of the Jesus Seminar, which is attempting to determine exactly what Jesus might have said. Does that make sense to you as a scholar or as a person of faith? Should it make sense to one of us? Ah. Well, I'm not a member of the Jesus Seminar, but the founder of the seminar, a brilliant man named Robert Funk, who died a few years ago, used to teach on the Vanderbilt faculty. I have his old office, which is really quite nice. Um, what the Jesus Seminar did, and this is now 20, 30 years ago, brilliantly, is open up the arcane world of biblical studies to the people at large so that anybody in the pew, anybody with a library card, or now anybody with access to Amazon, can simply read stuff and say, here's what people are saying in the academy. And for a number of people in the churches, they kind of wonder, gee, if their pastors and priests knew all that stuff, how come it wasn't making its way from the pulpit to the pew? So by opening up questions about Jesus, questions about how to understand the miracles, how to understand the incarnation and the resurrection, how to understand his teachings about politics or women or law, I think that was brilliant. But the Jesus of the Jesus Seminar isn't my Jesus. The Jesus of the Jesus Seminar is not terribly Jewish. He's much more universal. Uh, the Jesus of the Jesus Seminar is not expecting the kingdom of God immediately to break in, in the sense of the change in the world as we know it. I think Jesus was. So what does the Jesus Seminar do for us? It opens up the terms of the debate. And I think anybody who wants to talk about Jesus and open up and say, here's what I see in the Bible, and I'm going to read it for myself, rather than have somebody from the pulpit tell me what to think, I think that's brilliant. Right. <laughs> what, what is the basis for the devotion of so many evangelical Christians to the state of Israel? Uh, um, questions of Christian Zionism typically get portrayed in contemporary media is the Christian Zionist wants to get all the Jews to Israel and therefore because there's not enough room to expand settlements so that when Jesus comes back they'll be there to greet him um, or that we need to get them all there so that he can come back. Um, to my friends who are Christian Zionists who believe that I've told them I'm personally holding up the show because I'm not moving to Israel. My husband has an allergy to sesame products. The hummus would kill him within about 10 minutes. Um, but Christian Zionists, um, really, the Christian Zionist agenda is quite broad. Um, some Christian Zionists support Israel because they look at, it, look at it as a democracy in the Middle East. They look at it as America's ally. A number of Christian Zionists are what might be called America firsters. Uh, they believe because Genesis says, uh, God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, that it would be good to bless Abraham's descendants because that's what God wants them to do. Some of them look at Israel as a bulwark against increasing um, uh, Islamicization or against uh, questions of what Iran might do. Some of them want to support Jews in Israel because Jesus was a Jew and there's a thank you and a reciprocity. Some of them remember the horrors of World War II and think that a debt needs to be paid. There are a variety of reasons why Christian Zionists are concerned about Israel. There are also a number of Christian Zionists who are concerned about the Palestinians. So it does not help us to start stereotyping. To be in favor of one group, the state of Israel, does not mean to deny the concern for what I would call the legitimate rights of the Palestinian people to self-determination.
so then what do we do about this? Um, I'm a permanent consultant for an organization called Americans for Peace Now, APN, and I would encourage you to look at their website. APN is the sister organization to the Israeli group Shalom Akshav, the major peace organization in Israel. Um, I'm also a Zionist. I believe that Jews have a homeland like other people have a homeland. And the land of Israel is the Jewish national homeland, as we know not only from the Bible, but from archaeological remains. I also believe that that's the homeland of the Palestinian people. And then we have to figure out how to let two people live together. If we can work that one out, I'll probably need a little bit more than three minutes. But we start by educating ourselves and listening to all sides and not shutting people down and not stereotyping, but listening to the legitimate voices of people over there who also want peace and who are hurting, really hurting, because it hasn't occurred yet. In recent surveys on religious attitudes and beliefs of Americans, the category none of the above is the fastest growing. How do you as a woman of faith, or how do we as people of faith, enter into meaningful conversation with those who claim to be none of the above, or perhaps even people of no faith at all, atheists? Right, because again, faith is not a matter of academics, so coming up with an apologetic saying, you ought to believe in God, is really not helpful. And to say you ought to believe in God and Jesus, because if you don't, you're going to fry in hell, is usually ineffective evangelism. It's just not helpful. Because then people get scared and God becomes a bully and that's not terribly helpful. Um, what I find in terms of evangelism or faith proclamation is um, show what you do. Francis of Assisi once said, proclaim the gospel always, use words only when necessary. So how does one show what faith means? Why is it important? You get out and you do it. So you make sure that faith is not just a once a week thing. You do it between 11 and 12 on Sunday morning. And if you put a 20 in the collection plate, which is not a bad idea. I would go a little higher I than that. So, but yeah. you, you're, um, you're trending in the right direction. Yeah, I thought so. I wanted, I wanted to end on a high note. Um, uh, but that might not be the best way of doing it. Because if you begin with theology, it's usually a non-starter. I would begin with the Bible, in part because I know it better in part because people are familiar with terms like prodigal son or good Samaritan or Adam and Eve, and then say, you know, this is not only great literature, this is fabulous ethical teaching. This is cultural grounding. This is material that if you read it, you would probably be a better person for it. If the faith comes later, terrific. But if not, at least you will have read a good book and had a decent conversation, and that's a nice way of starting. The category, none of the above, includes many of our children. And for Jews, traditionally, passing the, the Jewish tradition on to children is at the core of, of the Jewish experience. How do you advise those of us whose children may be part of none of the above? Ah, um, it's certainly possible that my children would fall under that category in terms of theism, in terms of particular belief. But in Judaism today, in traditional Judaism, you're a Jew if your mother's a Jew. There's nothing you can do about it. Right? And in the reform movement, you're a Jew if either parent's a Jew and you're raised in a Jewish household. So I mean, we've already got them. Right? Um, baptism is helpful here for those churches that baptize little children or baptize infants. Um, what my husband and I try to do is to show them what Jewish values are, uh, to show them how Jewish ritual functions and how beautiful it is to show them that they can debate with their own tradition because there may be certain things in the tradition they do not like. That is not a good reason to leave. That's a good reason to stay and fight for what you do like. To encourage them to be members of a congregation where they will feel welcome rather than feel like they're fifth wheels. Single people have a hard time in a number of congregations. To provide them inspiration again, to get on the phone and say, where were you? To let them know that regardless of what they believe, because again, I cannot control that, how they act is extremely important to me. And what my husband and I have tried to do with our two children is inculcate in them Jewish values, which are basically the same as Christian values. You love your neighbor as yourself, if you see your neighbor doing something wrong, you rebuke the neighbor, that's called tochika. 
you love the stranger as yourself, and you try to act the way you think God would want you to act, because you too are in the image and likeness of God. We do our best and more, we do our best to model it. And will this work? I certainly hope so. We have time for one more quick answer. What does a Jewish scholar want to say to a predominantly Christian audience on the eve of Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter? May you have a blessed weekend and a happy Easter, and may the season be inspirational to you. And as you celebrate your holidays, recognize that the Lord and Savior you proclaim was also a first century Jew, and for Jews to recognize that as well so that we can recover not only our common roots, but also be able to celebrate our differences. We're part of the same tree. We're just different branches. And unless we're both familiar with that commonality, we come up a little bit short in each way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy Jill Levine.